wanted to welcome everybody to our uh, essentially our pop-up conference on the future of antitrust policy and enforcement globally. Uh, my name is James Keat. I'm the director of the Fordham Competition Law Institute and also director of global development at the Brattle Group. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, to Juris uh, for putting this uh, together. We obviously coordinated it uh, with, uh, with the FTC to make sure they did something uh, good for us the day before. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe our, 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 our little conference here is misnamed uh, because the future that we were gonna talk about is, is upon us um, with the, uh, or at least in part with the Facebook case dealing with nascent acquisitions, with the Google case, uh, uh, you know, just uh, very recently uh, with a more traditional section two case. And obviously with the continued activity uh, across a number of industries in Europe and the member states uh, and the ROW, the rest of, of the world. And so uh, it's, it, it's unusual to talk about the future. It's, it's just uh, things are happening pretty quickly now. And that's even without the, the uh, change in administration uh, here in the US. Uh, today, we put together a panel of antitrust uh, icons uh, to, to discuss you know, these and, and these and other issues. And so I will briefly uh, introduce everybody. I'll start with our uh, foreign guest, Olivier Garçon, who is the Director General of, uh, of DG Comp, uh, who has been uh, in the government on competition and the non-competition issues uh, since the, the mid eighties, um, heading uh, units of, of merger control, cartels, policy. Uh, he was the director general of the director general for uh, financial stability. Um, I think it's financial services and capital markets uh, and is uh, taken over in recent years right in the heart of these very complex, uh, interesting and dynamic uh, issues. So there's a lot of big decisions uh, uh, coming out of uh, DG Comp, uh, even as we speak. Uh, next, we have Eleanor Fox, who is a professor of trade regulation uh, at NYU, a true uh, preeminent expert in global antitrust and regulation. Uh, an enormous uh, long list of publications and awards uh, has focused uh, in, on uh, antitrust regulation in developing countries, which was a very uh, important uh, and needed uh, effort uh, and does great things there. And of course, I use uh, her book uh, when I teach uh, comparative antitrust at Fordham. Uh, Bill Kavasik. Everybody knows, but I'll, I'll do a little bit. Um, former FTC chairman, professor at GW, director of, the, uh, of, of their Competition Law Center, a non-executive director of uh, the UK Competition and Markets Authority, advises countries on how to do antitrust, a uh, long list of publications and awards. Uh, and I use his book, when, I, it, when teaching the general antitrust course at Fordham. And then finally, Barry Hawk, uh, close friend, founder of the Fordham Competition Law Institute, where he himself was a longtime uh, monopolist uh, while uh, the, the rest of the world just decided not to do conferences. And then of course, it's now become an incredibly saturated marketplace. So uh, Barry obviously didn't innovate enough or, or engage in, exclusionary strategies. Uh, that's apparently my job now as, as, the, as the director. Uh, also, Barry was a former professor of antitrust uh, and also of legal history. And we were uh, former partners together at Skadden Arps. Barry founded uh, the Brussels office uh, for Skadden, which is, uh, was an enormous and is an enormous success. And uh, Barry's also, along with everybody here, a prolific writer and I just wrote, recently wrote a book on the history of antitrust and competition laws that explores actually quite interesting, really ancient uh, competition and, and regulation 
regimes uh, published by Juris, and I believe available on Amazon, if I have it right. Uh, so it's an incredible panel um, for today. I think, I think there will be opportunities uh, for Q&A at the end, if we shall see. Um, what we're going to do in terms of format is each of our speakers will give a brief opening comments, you know, three to five minutes or so. Um, and then we will dive uh, into these topics. We'll probably start with nascent acquisitions given recent events. And so why don't we start with, uh, with these brief openings and I'll start um, really, this is, just, I didn't tell anybody which order we're going, so here we go. But why don't we start with uh, Eleanor? Okay, well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. So you have actually assigned me a subject matter, James, and it is the rest of the world. Oh, I did kind of, yes. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> the rest of the world, obviously, not US, not EU, but the rest of the world. Uh, so I want to say a word about the future of antitrust from the eyes of the rest of the world. And I'm thinking both very short term and longer term. So first two subjects I want to mention. Um, number one, um, when you think about the future of antitrust, what is the future of the status of antitrust in the political economy stratosphere? And here I am predicting that there might be less trust in markets and antitrust and especially from the rest of the world, less trust that markets and antitrust are really going to make people's lives better economically, which means that that might be a bigger element for regulation and industrial policy. So number two from the rest of the world, I was thinking also thinking down the line and maybe a 10 year horizon, we might expect more regional competition law um, so that regions such as in South America and Africa and Asia uh, could play a larger role in antitrust policy and enforcement. So third, um, what about antitrust within the, the realm of antitrust as it is? So from the point of view of the rest of the world, I would like to say that we ought to be listening to some separate voices that are not necessarily the voices of convergence. And here I would point from rest of the world, it includes lots of both developed countries and developing countries and the middle emerging economies. And there's a combination here of countries and their competition agencies whose voices are being heard along a slightly different plane and perhaps more activist and pinpointing issues for the future. So I would definitely mention UK and CMA, the Competition Markets Authority, which is really out front in thinking about, are there new forms of power that ought to be controlled? Um, do we still go with the usual uh, neoclassical definition of what is monopoly power and dominance or are we going to be looking at something which actually the CMA has called strategic market status? And I think um, CMA is out front in thinking about both new forms of how you define market power, um, thinking about excessive pricing, thinking about digital regulation, even though the EU is doing it. Um, look, another voice to look at is the Netherlands. Uh, which is taking on the issue of sustainability. This is a new issue, which I think is a future issue of antitrust. Uh, the Nether uh, obviously EU and Olivia and might um, make a mention of it. EU is thinking about how to accommodate um, environmental sustainability with antitrust. Um, but Netherlands is going even further and thinking um, better environment is better for people as consumers. Um, Japan and Korea, giving us insights into abuse of superior bargaining power, another big issue for the future. Um, Australia, giving us insights into news media and their being under the control of digital. China, as 
offering some really interesting thoughts in their proposed guidelines on the digital platform, uh, which would in some cases say you don't even have to define markets and also saying that questioning whether data might be an essential facility. Um, if I turn to another way of framing it, um, thinking about mergers and then thinking about monopoly, I would say that from the rest of the world point of view, there ought to be more central control that might enjoy mega mergers and other issues that they're putting on the table, which I also think are issues for the future, are public interest and mergers using um, merger law or opportunity to promote small and middle-sized business and protect workers. Um, monopoly and dominance uh, for developing countries, especially questioning power and feeling that they need to promote issues of market access even to data and to platforms and to promote the idea of inclusiveness more than some of the developed economies do. Uh, so these are my conclusions on this very quick run through the world. But there are some separate voices in the world. Some of those separate voices are not leading towards consensus. Some of those voices might actually promote it, be on the path to promoting a new consensus. Um, those voices are um, taking up four points. One is economic power. Should we have more flexibility in defining it? Um, distributional issues and unfairness, public interest, and the standing of antitrust in the political economy firmament. Thanks. Eleanor, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's quite an overview uh, and all very, very interesting points. Uh, Olivier, uh, your uh, opening thoughts. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, I, I was extremely interested by, by the remarks of uh, Eleanor. Um, well, I center, you, you assigned me a task as well, and that's the EU, no surprise. Uh, and uh, and the, the challenges that, uh, that we are um, ongoing here. Um, well, I, I, I first have to say, by like any, any good standard of law, competition law in the EU, like in the US, uh, shows the necessary flexibility. Uh, in order to adapt to virtually an infinity of competition policies. Oh, well, you, you have it traditionally in the US when you change administration and, uh, and uh, you, you show every four years that uh, indeed you have a number of permanences, but you also a number of flexibilities and enforcement priorities with the same legal standards. It's pretty much the same in the, in the EU. Uh, to give the extreme example, article, what is no article uh, 106 of the treaty, on public monopolies uh, for the first 30 years of the EU was interpreted as authorizing uh, national commercial public monopolies for utilities and for the next 30 years uh, was interpreted as prohibiting them um, and not a comma has changed in, uh, in the article of the treaty. So of course, I mean, this is, this is quite an extreme example, uh, but it's fair to say uh, that uh, changes change is the only constant uh, of EU competition rules and it never stopped evolving with the times over the last six decades. And I, I think this is for numerous uh, reasons. First, the economic reality we deal with evolve and that triggers necessary adaptations. Uh, for example, big tech confronts uh, antitrust, partly with new problems and partly with old issues uh, dressed in new clothes, I would say. Uh, and more generally, the digital economy impacts virtually all parts of the economy and transforms sometimes very deeply the economics of traditional sectors. And that triggers adaptation the way we enforce in these sectors. Um, the necessity to decarbonate our economies, uh, and Eleanor just referred to it, uh, in as little time as three decades, uh, if we want to keep our planet reasonably hospitable for human beings, uh, shakes also the boundaries of traditional definition of consumer welfare. Uh, and I'll come to, to that a bit more in detail in a second. So all these challenges confront, I think, all antitrust authorities everywhere in the world. And, uh, and this is why uh, our president, von der Leyen, uh, in a mission letter to Mrs. Vesteyer um, in September last year, stated that uh, uh, Mrs. Vesteyer should evaluate and review Europe's competition rules to make them fit for a modern economy. 
let me let me evaluate what, what this means. I mean, that means that uh, we have put for evaluation and review virtually all of our rules, uh, and uh, this process will uh, stop somewhere in the beginning of 2022. Uh, that's the largest ever review of our rules, and that follow, I would say, two different threads. One is how to do better with the existing standards. Uh, can we make efficiency gains? We sure can. I'll come to that in a second. And two, uh, do we need new instruments and new powers? Uh, are they indispensable? And if yes, uh, which ones? So let's, let me take briefly these two trends. Uh, I, I say up front that I will not deal with state aids because it's so idiosyncratic to the, to the EU. Um, so in the first stream, you will find, for example, uh, the uh, review of the article of Article 22 of the EU major regulation uh, that was announced by Mrs. Versteyer in September uh, in order to be able to capture better killer or nascent acquisitions uh, through our major control regime without having to uh, change the legislation. Uh, you remember that uh, uh, Article 22 is so-called Dutch clause and it was introduced in the major reg uh, by member states that were not sure they wanted to be equipped with national major control regime. Mm -hmm. um, then for, for reasons that I don't know about, because as you said, I was doing financial regulation, uh, um, the interpretation of the commission was that the power to refer is the power to, uh, to rule. So in other words, that if you didn't have competence by virtue of your national con major control regime, you could not refer a merger to the commission. Uh, but it seems to me that it defeats the very reason why it was introduced in the law, uh, which was for member states that precisely did not have that power because they would not have any uh, merger control regime, which is still the case of uh, at least uh, Luxembourg in, in, in the EU. So for this reason, we think we, we can revert to the original reason why it was introduced on the low member states to refer to as cases for which they do not have jurisdictions. And uh, that would not take care of all of the issues of nascent and killer acquisitions, but quite a, a good part of it. Um, also, you uh, uh, will find the review of a market definition notice. Uh, there is a lot of things that are said about this, but the, the, the simple truth is it's 22 years old. And uh, when it was drafted, I was one of the drafters at the time. I can tell you there is not a line on digital markets. There is nothing on uh, uh, non-price market. Uh, so, I mean, there is a lot to update uh, there. But I think those that believe that uh, the new uh, guidelines will uh, uh, allow the commission to find global markets everywhere will, will be disappointed. Uh, so we didn't intend to, to move too far away from uh, pretty much uh, what Eleanor, I think, referred to as traditional uh, economics uh, and define the uh, markets from the point of view of the possibility for consumers to make arbitrage. Um, you will also find in antitrust a comprehensive review of vertical restraints, uh, not completely uh, uh, without interest in the framework of the digital economy. Um, you will find a more uh, a policy to make a more targeted and also more uh, frequent use of interim measures, as we started to do in the Broadcom case, and also uh, a, a use of uh, settlements, as in the e-books. All this in order to try to move the time for decision closer uh, to the start of the investigation. Um, so. And finally, uh, 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 something that Elena also referred to, uh, you, you, you can expect to see a continuation of the re a reflection that started quite a long time ago in the EU in 2012 with the Microsoft LinkedIn mer merger case, which is, I mean, where are the boundaries uh, of the non-price aspects of consumer surplus, uh, basically? Uh, which, uh, which is linked to all the issues about the, uh, how do you incorporate positive externalities, uh, which is uh, uh, the big discussion we currently have uh, uh, led by the commission, but also our Greek and uh, as Elena said, uh, Dutch colleagues. Uh, should we take into account out of market efficiencies? Should we not? What is the standard is 101.3? All this is extremely 
lively and active discussion in, in, the, in the EU. The second stream, uh, you will find essentially two things, what we call the DMA. Uh, the DMA is like, it's basically a very traditional uh, unfair practices regulation. Uh, and it is rooted in antitrust enforcement in the sense that uh, it is about basically having a list of do's and don'ts that is based on, on 20 years of enforcement uh, uh, of antitrust rules for digital platforms, starting with the first Microsoft case. Uh, and uh, we know that there are practices that were, were they are put in place by these, uh, these big platforms in two-sided markets, markets prone to tipping, huge network effects, invariably uh, they cause the monopolization of an adjacent market in no time. And uh, uh, we take a decision three, four, five years later. So yes, we put big fines, but no, uh, we cannot uh, make any good to the damage that was done to, uh, to, to competition. Uh, so we want to change this by having uh, outright prohibition of a number of practices and a number of, uh, of uh, things that uh, would be mandatory in the field of uh, transparency and interoperability, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And second, uh, uh, what we call the foreign uh, subsidy instruments. Uh, I said I wouldn't talk about uh, state aids. That's a little bit about state aids. Um, the idea here is that we, we don't see why we should be very strict with the member states for state aids that uh, impact competition in the single market. And at the same time, we would be toothless when foreign jurisdictions are just doing that. So that's, that's basically the gist of it. So targeted acquisition, heavily subsidized by foreign powers, uh, but also large uh, operational aid to, to large uh, companies uh, having an impact on the working of competition in the single markets are, are the things that are targeted here. And just to finish, uh, we have also considered the possibility um, to, 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 to walk in the footsteps of our colleague at CMA. I agree with uh, I don't know, they, 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 they have quite a leadership in terms of uh, uh, forward thinking. They have for quite a long time now an instrument in order to be able to intervene when in the absence of any infringements in markets that dysfunction. Uh, so it's a bit the minority report of, uh, of antitrust. Uh, you, you intervene before the crime is committed. Uh, so. Uh, but uh, for this, we, we, we decided that it is not a matter of priority now, so we may come back later, but uh, you should not expect uh, a move in this, uh, in this field for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. Um, really, an, uh, so much going on, uh, to, it's almost hard to keep uh, track of. Uh, which, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Bill, who will put it uh, you know, all in context. Thank you, James, and uh, thank you so much for convening our our, our conversation today. Um, uh, yeah, when you when you sit in a seminar as a student and others go first, uh, you have the challenge of taking what they said and reflagging it as your own um, as you go through the room. Uh, and having watched my students, I've I've become expert in copying their best methods. So I'm going to do that too. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to identify a handful of. Uh, uh, developments and challenges for, for institutions uh, that, that have, uh, in many respects, global connections. Uh, the first is the, the choice facing uh, jurisdictions over the configuration of the policymaking process. And what is striking in the interest in regulatory frameworks is how several jurisdictions are going ahead very quickly to establish a new framework for oversight, sometimes for intervention that relies more heavily on regulatory tools. Uh, Olivier uh, just uh, alluded to uh, uh, the, the EU's efforts. Um, the United Kingdom this week announced uh, its digital program, which will involve the creation of a new institution called the Digital Markets Unit, which for its start will be, uh, will be housed in the Competition and Markets Authority. The European Union is going ahead quickly with its own program. China has announced regulatory initiatives, Australia as well. Within a period of two or three years, we're going to have several distinct streams of oversight dealing with, for the most part, many of the same companies or certainly affecting the same companies. Uh, these will be multidisciplinary, multifunction initiatives that will have some traditional elements of competition policymaking, but will involve uh, ex-ante rulemaking, 
I think increasingly will involve the convergence of disciplines such as consumer protection, competition, data protection, uh, traditional sectoral regulation. And from this will emerge the new framework uh, from which policymaking uh, will take place. An interesting question is each of these systems will have significant regulatory spillovers. Uh, that is because they are dealing with large multinational enterprises. Uh, the choices made by each will not simply affect the jurisdiction in question, but will affect the others. Um, will we have three, four, maybe more distinct sets of regulatory commands? And what kind of process of reconciliation will derive from this superior techniques, coherence for purposes of planning? I don't think that conversation is taking place right now. Uh, I think we're going to get these separate mechanisms in place. Then we'll start talking about a process of reconciliation. I think ideally that would be taking place in parallel with the development of the new mechanisms, but the new mechanisms are gonna be in place pretty fast. And as a footnote to that, uh, the US, I do not think will have it in place uh, anytime soon. That's going to probably require some form of legislative intervention. There's discussions about doing that, um, but the US is going to be watching this while interestingly, it is using the older regulatory technology which consists of antitrust litigation. That's going to be its main policy making mechanism. So first, what configuration uh, makes sense? Uh, second uh, basic challenge I see is capability. And, and to put it in an unsentimental way, how good are agencies going to be at doing this? Do they have the right human capital? Do they have the capacity to make real-time adaptations to their base of knowledge to understand what's going on? Uh, I haven't done this survey, but I would be interested in knowing for competition agencies around the world, what is the total number of computer or information scientists that they employ today as full-time employees in their agencies? Is that number greater than 100 globally? Is it between 50 and 100, 20 and 50, less than 20? That is how many institutions have that kind of tech capacity organically in-house. Now you can contract out for it, but every time, and I'm, I am a non-executive director at the CMA, so I, I, have, a, I have a horse in this race too. Uh, every time I see a public official on the competition side speak of these issues, I simply wonder, uh, trained as many of them are, as I am as a lawyer, what do you know about this? And where do you get your knowledge? An innovation that I think the CMA has taken forward that I think will be emulated over time is they have a dedicated data team. They have a dedicated team of the kinds of people I'm speaking about and not just one individual whom you can trot out to a podium to say that we have the capability. It's backed up with, it's a, with a team that's supporting the work of the institution internally. Uh, it continues to evolve, but it provides the internal capacity to help guide the analysis of some of these issues. That's hard enough, I would suggest, for well-funded, established institutions. What happens when we go to many parts of the rest of the world where that capacity doesn't exist? How do they get it? Because many of them want to do work in this area, they must. But where do you get the capacity to do this work? And are you going to end up with a great mismatch between capabilities and commitments to do work in this area? There are ways to overcome that. Uh, one way is to work very hard in building partnerships, what Alan Fells used to call uh, co-producers, partnerships with academic hubs in the region, within your own country. I think that becomes desperately important to bring in this type of expertise. A second is to develop on your own or with others, uh, better ability to do analytics, data and management. Uh, it is a conceit of our modern time that we think that our circumstances are so different, in some ways they are, but I think a more detailed look at the history of our field going back to the late 19th century will show us that there really are variations on older themes that we have seen before. This is not the first tech upheaval in the, in the modern, modern history of the world. Uh, it, is, uh, it is one of many, it has important features, it goes faster, but 
if we were able to look in a more careful way at what we have learned from the early experience, I think there would be an enormous amount that would be valuable. There is, in effect, the equivalent of antitrust competition big data that agencies and institutions have, but we don't mine it so well. Uh, we have a tendency to forget what's taken place before. It's a reason that Barry's recent contribution to the literature is so interesting. I'm afraid in too many ways, the repositories for the knowledge are, uh, dare I say, old people who have been around for a while and are carrying the data sets around between their ears, uh, sometimes committing it to paper, but institutions have to do better than that to make use of this data and do it as a conscious process. And a third way to build capability is to mimic best techniques for management and organization. And here I am such a fan of the UK, a reason I think the UK is going to emerge much more strongly as a formidable voice, not as a member of the European Union, to my regret, but as an independent voice in policymaking, uh, is that it has the best mechanism I've seen on the planet for deciding what's the strategy, what are the priorities to execute the strategy, and what is the methodology for selecting projects as part of a portfolio to carry it out. If you're going to move from inside the production possibilities frontier out to realize the fullest expression of your potential, that's what you're going to have to do, and you're going to have to study agencies that do it well. I think the CMA has done that particularly well. And a last ingredient, two ingredients, I think cooperation, as Eleanor mentioned, on a smaller scale with similarly situated uh, uh, jurisdictions, but jurisdictions like the new collaboration among the UK, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States with some similar configurations and policy uh, possibilities. And finally, what about convergence in all this? I think at some point we're gonna come back to the WTO and we are gonna see, are there simple basic steps we can take to achieve commonality and apply it? I would foresee the reestablishment of the competition working group at the WTO and where will they start? They'll start with cartels. They'll use the same kind of plurilateral agreement they've used for government procurement and we'll try to start the broad global enforcement process with something that commands general agreement. Thank you, Bill. And uh, both fascinating and incredibly practical. And so uh, I'd like to be a, a fly on the wall at the ICN in the coming, uh, in the coming years to see how they put all this uh, together in a potentially consistent way. Now, Barry, you could just say everything they said. Um, but uh, what, are, what are your opening thoughts? Uh, thank you, James. Uh, let me say following, uh, <laughs> following talks by Eleanor, Olivier, and Bill is a bit like uh, my trying to sing a Puccini aria following the three tenors, right? So <laughs> uh, this will be interesting. But let me, let me try to offer an historical perspective to the question. What's the, your question is, what's the future of antitrust? History suggests that we're entering a period of more aggressive antitrust enforcement and judicial approval outside the United States, certainly outside the United States, around the world. In the US, uh, the US, my prediction is, and this is yet, there will be more aggressive enforcement. We're seeing that already, but it's not as clear as it is outside the US that courts will support that aggressive enforcement. Now, why do I, what does history have to do with this? Uh, my, my reading of the history of centuries of antitrust and competition law is that the law changes to reflect three related factors. Changes in economic conditions, developments in economic theory, and political support for enforcement. Those three, they're my three, they're my three important historical factors. And there are many historical examples. One is the history of European and English common law bans on forestalling, uh, which ultimately in the 18th, 19th century ended in the, uh, the repeal of bans on forestalling. A second example of this influence of conditions, theory, and politics is the most expansionary period of US antitrust law, which began with politics, Roosevelt's decision in 1937 to shift from cooperation to competition, 
and therefore enforce the antitrust laws. To the post-war economic conditions and economic theory that supported very aggressive antitrust until the late 1970s. Now, let me say here, yes, Virginia, there's a Santa Claus. Yes, Virginia, there was economic theory before uh, the, uh, the 1970s and consumer welfare analysis. You may not have liked that economic theory, but it was there, right? So it didn't all begin in the 1970s, economics. Now, given this historical triad, it's not surprising that antitrust laws are strengthening around the globe. Indeed, it would be surprising if they weren't uh, strengthening around the globe. Economic conditions have changed, or maybe more importantly, there is now a prevailing belief that economic conditions have changed, uh, at least in the digital part of the world. Second, economic theories are being developed to deal with these new conditions. Third, political enforcement, uh, political support for enforcement is strong, okay? So you got all three elements all going the same way. However, however, in the United States, since the late 1970s, the US has added a fourth factor to the development of antitrust law, and that's it, it's court factors uh, where courts have expressed concerns or assumptions which generate what I'll call an, in, an inhospitality toward antitrust law. I won't go as far as say hostility because they still say the Sherman Act is a wonderful thing, the Chart of Liberty, but the courts for various uh, reasons expressed in opinions mostly are generally have been generally inhospitable to the application of US antitrust law. I'll name three because we could spend days on this. One is, and this expressed in the opinions, all right, the cost of antitrust litigation just cost too much, particularly private actions. No problem of addressing that concern if you're a lawyer is that's a concern as much about the federal rules of civil procedure than it is about substantive antitrust laws. You know, there's too much discovery. Uh, or there's, do we really need years of discovery, expensive discovery, pretrial motion practice, class action certification system? Okay. Second concern or assumption, the fear of false positives and chilling effects of overly broad substantive rules. Okay. Third, very importantly to me, assumptions that market power will self-correct without government intervention. Okay. So I'm asserting here that those three concerns, which are not economic theory in a, in a, in a, a historian of economics graduate school, they, they have generated an inhospitality in the courts against the application of antitrust law. It's what Olivier had mentioned several weeks ago at another conference, it's the US legal culture, okay? Uh, it's the same, that's what I'm getting at the same thing. And the Supreme Court decision in Amex illustrates to me the important role of these assumptions, which arguably explain why the conservative majority and the liberal minority would arrive at opposing conclusions on technical economic issues, like how do you define markets and platform industries? Amex suggests to me, or that split suggests to me, it's something else is going on, right? Uh, 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 and what's going on is, these underlying, sometimes stated, sometimes hidden assumptions that show this inhospitality. Now, whether that suggests to me, and I'll finish that, it said outside the, the three the economic conditions have changed, the digital world has changed things, the economic theories are developing, this political support is generating uh, uh, more aggressive enforcement. Some of that enforcement may not be in traditional institutions, it may suggest more combined regulatory, that's possible. In the US, my guess, my guess the, the chief obstacle to uh, more successful aggressive enforcement is the, is the uh, is in hospitality of courts. So parties uh, will have to, this really is gonna go to the lawyers. It's not gonna go to the professors or the people writing books about big is bad and all this. It's going to be whether the lawyers supported by the, con the economists can successfully address these concerns, these assumptions to get the courts to accept the actions that are now being brought. 
uh, and I'd say that it's spent a long time and how do you do that? It's not easy to get at somebody's worldview or hidden assumptions, particularly if they're hidden. I'll stop. And you don't see, uh, one last thing, you don't, unless Olivier, I don't, and Eleanor, you're more, Bill, I don't see in court opinions these kinds of concerns expressed. You don't see it in the court of justice, general court. There's no opinions of, well, the costs are too high, you know, antitrust, we, we've got to narrow the rules, right? I'll stop, thank you. Thank you, Barry. You know, just hearing the initial comments of everybody is enough to chew on, I think, for, for, uh, for, for weeks, uh, if not more. There, is, there really is much more going on globally uh, than people know. And uh, Eleanor, we might have a task in something we're writing together to, uh, to get it all down on, on paper. Um, so let's move to some of the topic areas. And we'll start with nascent or so-called nascent or killer acquisitions. We'll talk a little bit in the context of Facebook because it, it just happened yesterday, but obviously we can talk about the, the same issues that we'll talk about a little bit with respect to Facebook will be challenges, I think, uh, multi-jurisdictionally as well. And, and so we can talk about that. Uh, but first I wanna get everybody's kind of couple sentence reaction uh, to the filing uh, yesterday and, and whatever your reaction uh, happened to be. And why don't we start with Bill, just a quick reaction. I think the narrative in the two complaints is pretty powerful. Uh, and by that, I mean the discussion about events that took place from roughly 2010 uh, to the present, but especially from 2010 through 2013. Uh, the, uh, high, the reproduction of the high level conversation within Facebook about the perception of the significance of Instagram, WhatsApp, other firms, and the approach taken to address it. Uh, um, I, I, I am sure, as happens in all litigation, there is a larger context for that. And I look forward to seeing that. Yet, in a fairly vivid way, uh, one thing that took me the most in reading those complaints was the seemingly conscious awareness at the highest levels of the company about how what had emerged initially as a complementary product had the potential to quickly, abruptly, decisively migrate into being a substitute and to topple the incumbent mechanism. And that immediate intervention was necessary to forestall that possibility uh, by absorption, by merger. Now, a key issue in the case, of course, is going to be that Facebook will, will object to all of these characterizations about how innovation and competition was suppressed. I, I imagine they'll say, uh, what did we do with them? Did we bury them? Kill them? No, we helped them realize their fullest potential. Uh, and that's what we did here. Uh, and and, and the, the alternative vision is a, a what if set of possibilities about how things could have been better. But, but I think as a starting point, I was very much taken by the narrative about the decisions taken at that time. And as a footnote, it makes me wonder, what did the FTC look at? Yeah, when it sure. considered the Instagram case. And if it looked at these very same documents, what was the factor that caused them to say, not here, not now, we're going to let it go? And I say that with some comfort because I was not at the commission when these decisions took place, but perhaps I would have to answer for Google double click, and that's a conversation I'm willing to have. All right, thanks. And uh, Eleanor, your, uh, your brief... Uh initial reaction. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Eleanor, you're, uh, you're muted. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I want to adapt a lot of what Bill said. It's a very powerful narrative. Um, it's a case that should be brought, should have been brought, and should be brought, and should be litigated. Um, given a very conservative law, which Barry uh, has laid out, um, it's very, there are a lot of soft points that is difficulties for the FTC and for the states to win the case. Um, so looking at it one way in terms of a case that should be brought, in my view, there are a lot of activities and strategies that Facebook took 
and that now we're seeing it in a holistic picture that in my view, if the facts of the FTC and the states are proved clearly anti-competitive strategy and should be determined to be an anti-competitive strategy. And it's not just the two huge acquisitions, but they are very important, but it is all along the way, as the complaints say, Facebook building a moat around itself to assure itself that it will not be competed against. Um, there are huge questions about the statute it should have been brought under. Is this really a monopolization case or is it an anti-competitive merger case? I think that the FTC actually made an interesting choice, which might be the better choice because we're now about eight years later and there have been other activities and covenants and agreements um, with users to stay away from competitors. So that the course of conduct has become very clear. The documents are very helpful in making that clear. At the end of the line though, supposing all that is the case, supposing even, which are difficult points, FTC proves that Facebook has has monopoly power, number one, very difficult point, has to prove the markets, has to prove power in the markets. Um, and number two, even proves enough so that the court will conclude that in under our very conservative law, Facebook abused the power by creating or entrenching market power. What then is the remedy? Um, it's not clear that divestiture is the remedy. In fact, given the uh, prior case law, including Microsoft itself, the court says divestiture and breakup should be rarely used. Um, so there might be real questions about remedy at the other end. To me, that doesn't disqualify the case though. It is a case that really had to be brought. It's gonna test the robustness or not of section two of the Sherman Act monopolization and might possibly lead the way to legislation. But I have to say that that's way down the line because the case won't be resolved if Facebook is resolved to litigate for years and it will be too late. Thank you, uh, Barry, uh, just a quick reaction. Okay, just two points. One, uh, uh, I, I've less, I'm less courageous than my colleagues on commenting on this complaint that was filed yesterday. <laughs> Uh, uh, one, uh, assuming the allegations in the complaint are true, this is not a radical case, all right? Uh, I mean, the, the narrative that the FTC puts out is, it's not radical. I'm not saying they should win, but it's not radical. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's some of the really early cases, Standard Oil and what have you had a series of acquisitions, blah, 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 right? So it's not radical, right? Okay, right. Uh, two, are they gonna win? That's back to what I said earlier. That's the question whether the courts, I, to me, my guess would be, this is gonna be their litigation strategy. Do you address these, what I'm calling inhospitality concern, concerns about cost, false positives? Uh, do you address that? At least when you get to the Supreme Court or do you just pretend they don't exist and you just do this, oh, well, we don't care about that. We'll just do our bring in the economist, blah, blah, blah. My guess is they, 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 they significantly, the FTC significantly increases its chance of success if it does address uh, these, these, these concerns, okay, which are not easy to address. It's not easy. And it's an interesting, I could see it's, there are tensions in a strategy. If I were the, if I were the, 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 the trial or appellate lawyers, there's how do I, how do I persuade justice? Otherwise, without, otherwise, Look, if the courts aren't going with you, you got to, got to replace the court, the bench. That's all. That's the that's that or legislation is the answer in our institution. It's not complicated. Thank you, Barry. Olivia, I know it's it's a U.S. case, but uh, you know it, it followed a monopolization path rather than a, a straight merger under Section Seven path. And so I'll ask you your reaction, but also is it something uh, that you're doing in in Europe is looking at you know what is the best tool. Uh, statutory tool, whether it's uh, the merger regs or 102, you know, to address uh, nascent acquisitions, then we'll get down to some of the nuances be between nascent versus killer, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, I, I guess I have three, three remarks. I, I, of course, will not come on the merits of the case. I, I just couldn't 
from a technical point of view and uh, wouldn't from a political point of view. <laughs> so, right. uh, um, but I mean, several things. Well, first of all, we do not have a monopolization standard in the EU. Uh, so, but the, strictly speaking, what is being done at the moment in the US, we couldn't do uh, that for. Um, now, second, uh, second remark, I, I mean, this, this emphasizes that, um, I mean, we are at the moment, I mean, taking the point Bill made in his opening remark, uh, yes, I mean, initiatives are flourishing all over the world in very different ways, but there is a real convergence in the issues we recognize as problematic, uh, the analysis of these issues, or the remedies or the means we use are different because they depend on legal culture, many, many other things. Uh, but 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 there is definitely a convergence. I mean, if you think where we were 10 years ago on this subject, uh, I think that's clear. And third, um, as, you, as you alluded to, uh, James, uh, killer acquisition is, is uh, what, what they, we call this in French, uh, uh, a, a mot valise, a suitcase word. So you, you can put everything you want in this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it, uh, I mean, it's acquisition of nascent innovative companies, but I mean, not, not necessarily to kill it, sometimes to develop it. Um, it, it actually, the, 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 the first cases were uh, spotted and analyzed in the, in the pharmaceutical sector. Well, this is the, the normal way to, I mean, look at the COVID-19 uh, uh, I mean, you have a, a nice startup in uh, having a promising RNA technology, no funding, difficult to raise the funds in Europe. Sloops partners with American firms go on the U.S. Uh, capital markets, raises the. Well, that's that's uh, that's not necessarily illegitimate. This is what I mean to say. Sometimes this is to kill them. Sometimes this is to keep them away. And uh, I agree, it's not necessarily easy to find that out uh, with a merger control standard. And when you're about pro making a prognosis on the future, um, I mean, yes. when you want to prohibit, it, you need you need to have at least a decent likelihood based on facts, and you not necessarily have it. So, um, and I'm saying I'm saying that because uh, I mean, maybe Bill, you will have to answer about uh, some Google case. Maybe I will have to answer as well. I mean, we're reviewing Google Fitbit for the moment. Uh, I, it's not. The, the final decision is not taken, so I will not comment on it. It's not an easy case. Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you, Olivier. You know, when I first read this, I thought of uh, the movie, uh, uh, The Treasure for Sierra Madre, you know, badges. We don't need no stinking badges. You know, <laughs> and I thought, well, Section 7, we don't need no stinking Section 7. Um, and the question I have is, OK, this is in part, uh, primarily about two past mergers. There was some conduct issues as well, Instagram and WhatsApp. Section seven in the US has an incipiency standard. It should be easier, it's May, but what sits out there unspoken or untalked about is the potential competition doctrine and case law that talks about having real present effects. And uh, I wanted just a reaction, is this, uh, a simple and appropriate way to simply bypass the potential competition doctrine under Section Seven. Quick. Thought. I don't. I, I don't uh, think it's a, a a simple bypass, James. I, I think that it is. It has its own uh, additional burdens and complications because when you're when you're looking at consummated mergers, and there's a there's a large, even recent experience in the U.S. Yeah, uh, challenging consummated mergers, uh, including those that did not receive a challenge when they were notified initially under the Hart-Scott mechanism. I'm thinking of cases like Evanston, which sure. the FTC brought when I was there, uh, Chicago Bridge and Iron, uh, yeah. uh, a, a group. Um, a burden I think you bear is that uh, unlike the ex ante review of a merger where you're making a prediction where the deal has taken place arguably you should have effects evidence that is you should be able to tell an effects story now because you're not making a, a guess about what will happen an informed judgment i'm not talking about mere guesswork uh an informed prediction about what would happen you should have effects evidence at that play at that point and 
again, you have you have fairly broad declarations in these complaints that innovation suffered. The pressure to provide better privacy protection was weakened. Uh, users got fewer choices. Uh, those are assertions that I think will be tested vigorously. And I can imagine a judge uh, saying, yeah, I read the complaint. It's a, it's a fascinating hypothesis. Can you give me some more specifics about how users are worse off? And I think there, the FTC in the States will be pushed back on saying, essentially, competition surprises you all the time. And when you have a dominant firm, and they are assuming that Facebook was dominant by 2011, when it made the deals, uh, when you have a dominant firm that essentially extinguishes a possibility for independent development of a rival, you can infer that other good things would have happened had the dominant firm not intervened that way. And the judge says, well, tell me more about that. Well, lost innovation, lost choice, and you go through the litany. And the judge says, do you have any more certain foothold than that uh, for me to look at? So I think, that, I think the burden you take on when you come at it ex post after a period of time is, I think there'll be an implicit assumption that, well, you're gonna have better effects evidence, right? And that's not, easily, that's not a burden that's going to be easily borne here. Thank you. And let me follow up, actually put it in a little more context for Eleanor and Barry and Olivier. Olivier had talked about, you know, some challenges with the but for world. And, and so for you three, you know, when you're not talking about a killer acquisition where you might have intent documents and they actually shut it down and, you know, what happened after is, can be demonstrated that way. You know, when you're looking at nascent acquisitions, how important is it to look for evidence at the time of the acquisition about what the but for world would have become versus what it did become. Uh, and what is that is that a, a necessary task? Um, can it just be you know assumed? Um, what are your thoughts on what comparison, if any, needs to be made? Uh, and, and based on at the time uh, of the acquisition, presumably. Um, Eleanor, you wanna start there? And, and okay, sure. And, and Bill really started us on this conversation. Um, I think that if this, if this were a pure merger case, as opposed to monopolization case, um, the agency, and it might be so in the monopolization case too, at what point of time do you have to look at the anti-competitive effects of the merger? And I think since the merger was concluded eight, nine years ago, um, I think to make a case now under section seven or section two, um, that FTC or states would have to prove the, the but for case, would have to prove that if these, um, companies had not been acquired by Facebook, maybe acquired by Google, maybe developed on their own, um, they would have um, been very strong competitors and maybe even taken over the space of Facebook and become the social network, which of course is a problem because is it, is it a competition for the market and it's only going to be one monopolist to the other because of the network effects, that's a trap. Um, but I think it would be absolutely necessary now because it's way after the merger to show that the merger is harmful today in ways that outweigh the benefits of the integration today. And we know there are benefits of integration today. I think if you're asking the question about the time of the merger, like Visa Plaid, but I don't know if you wanted to raise that right now, but it's, it's a the same issue. Yeah. Yeah. Merger. So it's slightly different now because this is at the point where Visa wants to acquire Plaid right now, yeah. um, but hasn't. I think the burdens should be different. I mean, I think that knowing that Plaid was about to enter that space and of which was um, servicing the payment systems for merger for uh, merchants on the payment cards that Plaid is 
quite positioned to enter the space and looks like it's going to be a great enterer of that space and told Visa that it's going to, it's thinking of entering the space. And Visa gets very concerned and goes to its books and says, oh my goodness, they're going to be taking over a quarter of the market in a couple of years. And, um, and, and Plaid also says, and you know, I'll charge the merchants only half the price you charge them. That kind of evidence of loss of that competition should be very, very powerful. And the government shouldn't have to go through the hypothetical of working it all out to consider whether, for example, Visa is going to be making use of Plaid in ways that's very integrative and a new wonderful product. So it does depend at the, of the time at which um, the merger is being attacked. Thank you. And Barry, your thoughts? Unmute yourself. Let me start with a, a, a question to our two U.S. law professors. I I thought this isn't isn't General Motors Dupont Supreme Court decision relevant here, and I forget what happened was the sure. Dupont very intelligently during the First World War starts buying shares in Little General Motors, and Little General Motors by the 1950s has the largest market share uh, of automobiles in the United States. So the Justice Department brings a lawsuit saying that DuPont's ownership of shares in General Motors violated, I'm embarrassed to say, I forget whether it was Section 2 and or Section 7. But the Supreme Court held that the time to determine the effects of the acquisition was at the time the complaint was filed, not the time of the initial acquisition in 1917, what have you. And the court then supported the, the lower court and said, well, so we look at the effects in whatever the date was, 1952-53, and the effects were, and you could argue about whether it was persuasive or not, but it was persuasive for the court. The court found that during the stock ownership, the stock ownership by DuPont influenced General Motors' decision to buy fabrics and paints and finishes, okay, uh, of automobiles. So it was a vertical, uh, influence, which the court, so you had anti-competitive effects. We could argue about whether that's good or bad, but that's what the court found. But the important thing was they looked at the effects the time the complaint was filed. So I guess I'm, if that, if that case is still the war, uh, I don't understand what all the fuss is about. The case is clear. The FTC can argue that yesterday is the time you examine the competitive effects, benefits, and harms of the acquisition. It's not why, why is it more complicated than that? Well, let me ask this, Barry, Barry and, and, and others, and then we'll go to Olivier. Um, with respect to General Motors, I think the marketplace changed. They, they increased their dominance they, uh, over, over the years. And, and I think that was at least a, a driving factor there. Does it matter if, if essentially the same information was available, uh, analyzed, analyzed for its potential uh, anti-competitive effects in 2012, in 2014, and determined to be too speculative, too soft, does that matter at all? Uh, not in terms of maybe equitable estoppel or latches, but as a matter of this issue of, of, of the but for world. So let me just leave it at that and then I'll, as an observation, and then ask Olivier, um, do you have these challenges in terms of looking at the but for world if, you look, if you're looking backwards uh, at these as opposed to ex ante? Um, and is that one of the things you're gonna address in terms of the standard review is uh, in that circumstance, how, how, do we, how do we assess the but for world? Yeah, well, thank you. Well, no, I mean, in a way, and this is probably a deficiency in our system. As I said, we do not have a monopolization standard, but it's not only that. We have Article 21 of the merger regulation. Mm -hmm. and Article 21 of the merger regulation says that only the merger regulations is applicable to mergers. Mm. So, <laughs> so well, what that means That would be that, good to the US then, apparently. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, in a way, that makes your life simpler because you don't have to ask yourself this type of question. Right. Because you cannot, I mean, you don't have a second chance. That's yeah. a, it's, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. 
Once it's done, it's done, uh, uh, unless we modify Article 21. Um, this, so, so the answer, the short answer is, is no, we don't have this, this type of issues, not really. But maybe two, two, two thoughts about what, uh, about what this case and what I just heard. I mean, for, for, for me, this is the old, the old question of competition for the market, competition in the market. I mean, what, what is it that, that we're trying to protect here? And this is, for me, one of the interests of, of this case. Um, and uh, is, is the acquisition of a non-yet competitor? Uh, um, I mean, how, what is the, your standard of proof in order to to show that what you were actually trying to do is to entrench your dominant position in your main market. Uh, and, and that I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm far from being a specialist of, uh, of US case law, but that, that I think is going to be the, from a European perspective, a very, very interesting aspects of, uh, of, of this. And the second, the second point that I'd like to, to mention is, uh, Surely, at some point, the, the issues of efficiency defense and some kind will come. Mm -hmm. um, we and and that is certainly something we we have to cope with in, in Europe as well. Of course, in the framework of mergers, but also in the frame of uh, 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 one hundred two enforcement. And and uh, this is this is a this is a, 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 an issue that develops uh, as we move forward with our, our digital market act as well. Uh, what big tech says, well, you ignore completely the efficiency gains, et cetera, et cetera. And what we, and they produce all tons of very fancy studies uh, that they paid for very, very uh, dearly. And, uh, um, and what we say basically is, well, look, I mean, all these studies look great, uh, what we see is that each time you put forward an efficiency defense in an actual case, uh, you didn't convince either us or the judge. Mm, right, right. So far. All right. Well, th thank you, Olivia. Um, that leads me to a question. It's interesting. In the opening remarks, there was in the digital economy, there was talks of different either having no market definition or having something like the, I think it was called the strategic market status. And, in, and this complaint actually is written very much about a strategic market status in terms of mechanisms or mechanics of social networking, you know, using pictures, using instant messaging, um, and, uh, and transitioning from uh, devices, from computers to mobile devices, and does a very good job of, of talking about uh, intent and strategy that way. But if you put the overlay, at least in the US, of market definition, I was struck by the fact that, uh, that Facebook already had, and again, I'm not, a, I'm not really a user myself, um, that Facebook already had direct competing products that were not doing as well, uh, both in terms of uh, for uh, Instagram and WhatsApp, um, and it just, in my mind, said, well, is this going to be difficult on market definition grounds when you're talking about competition for the market? And if you're using, at least in the U.S., traditional analyses, a hypothetical monopolist in the smallest market principle, isn't, can it be viewed and argued that, in fact, this is a smaller rival buying a larger rival uh, because it is seeding that it can't win the competition for the market in these narrow segments. And is that, or can we in a sense set that aside? And that would then make these obviously complements vis-a-vis the broader social networking uh, marketplace. And then you're back to the potential competition issue. But what do you make, all of you make, when you have the situation where you in fact have direct competition, in which case the defendant isn't the dominant firm. Um, and is, does that throw a wrench into the an analysis, at least in the US, where you, you have these uh, market definition principles that are fairly strictly followed? That's a mouthful, but I think you, I think, I think you, why don't we start Start with you, uh, Eleanor, and then move to Bill. Oh, okay. I think your very statement of 
the problems indicates i may have overstated it <laughs> no, no, no i mean i think it indicates why this idea that you must first define a market and yeah. then see whether the putative whether the defendant is dominant in the market or has market power in the market is begging too many questions that you first have to really try to understand who and what are being under uh, uh, being uh, exploited or excluded and how and so i think that we're actually going to have to move toward this much more flexible idea that you don't have to define your market and live with it. Uh, but so you gave a couple of really interesting examples where there'd be really a tough time both to define the market and to show the power, uh, increase the power in the market. I, and I think they should be bypassed. I also think that we may not be living in a world of smallest credible market anymore because of um, double two-sided market effects and that the yeah. whole market definition is really up for grabs. I do think that the FTC is going to have a lot of challenges in its own market definition, taking it as it is, um, both product and geographic. Um, because, of course, everybody who writes a complaint is gerrymandering a little bit if they have any trouble. Um, to make it seem that they did have the dominant share. Um, Bill, any thoughts on that? And then I, I'm going to move us a little faster to a few other topics. Uh, I, I, I think the I think the trend in analysis certainly uh, when I look at the U.S. public enforcement agencies has been to be more flexible. Uh, you know, where, where does the idea that you must define a relevant market come from? That language appears most emphatically in federal court decisions interpreting Section 7 of the Clayton Act. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do a search with that language, you will come up with a basket of cases in which the U.S. District Judge, and then echoed by the Court of Appeals, says, the necessary starting point in every Section 7 case is to define the relevant market. Uh, that is a that is a uh, almost a mechanically recited formula that comes up again and again. Uh, the agency. What, 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 Bill, what about Spectrum Sports? I think a Section 2 attempt case that kind of at least gets you into the monopolization statute. It, it does, although although if you go back to the famous definition in cellophane about what is monopoly power, the power to set prices or exclude competition. Um, in, in, a market, uh, and, in a market. Yeah, yeah. You know, although although I think if we back to Standard Oil, uh, you know, Barry mentioned earlier the the mergers as a mechanism for acquiring monopoly power. Um, Standard Oil said there are lots of ways to infer market power, direct effects. Indirect effect, indirect proof, uh, market yep. shares. Uh, I think the framework's always entertained, the, the monopolization framework has always entertained a more flexible approach. And there are anomalies, uh, there are blurred lines. You know, recall in Microsoft, yeah. um, is middleware part of mm -hmm. the relevant market? Uh, Netscape plus Java plus an austere operating system is a threat to Windows. Well, is middleware in the relevant market or not? Is it straddling? Is it in or is it out? Where is it? And that was a, that in many ways was an issue that I would say tribunals tended to skirt past because sort of in, sort of not, part of the future, not here right now, but it could be uh, uh, a, a, a difficult issue to, 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 to wrestle with. But I, but I think the, I, I think if you, if you go back to, to, the basic question I think posed in the prototypical cases, it was uh, uh, how is this behavior, what is the theory of harm and how does the conduct in question enable the defendant to, 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 to impose that harm on the, on, the, on the market? And there are a variety of ways to infer that, to prove that. Certainly monopolization implies a, a, a status, a position of preeminence. Uh, that makes the behavior much more a matter of concern. Uh, but it seems to me that the jurisprudence as a whole 
is flexible and entertaining a variety of approaches to answering the question. But, but as, as Eleanor mentioned before, and I think as you were suggesting before, James, in a case of this dimension, where to my mind, uh, if you don't get a breakup, you haven't delivered on, on, what, on the promise of the complaints. Uh, yeah. A case of this dimension, I can imagine the judge saying, yes, 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 it's flexible and adaptable, but tell me more about the basis. So I have to write the opinion. Right. Uh, and a few paragraphs that will say why they are dominant and how I know that. And tell me what I put in there, please. Uh, yeah. And it's not going to be satisfied by just saying, well, there are a lot of techniques. It's flexible, adaptable. He says, sure, but I, I have to explain how. Yeah. And one observation I'll make, obviously, that, that Eleanor raised, which is, Yes, in Microsoft, a Section 2 case, it's about ah, divestiture is really more for Section 7 when it's about acquisitions. Now, they're seeking those here, but they didn't move under Section 7. And so it's a, a, it's a, a slight twist there. And I think the other thing that obviously will be a challenge is typically in a divestiture scenario, you have something easy to divest, a, you know, a plant or some, some assets. And here you're talking about movie theaters. Getting, yeah. You know, movie theaters. You're getting, talking about, you know, spinning something off uh, someone else and getting users to want to do that rather than um, stay where they are. I think it'll be, be quite complicated. Um, related to the market uh, issues, you know, and kind of these technical things that are, again, more US-based, in dominance and monopolization generally looking into the future, the US is continually constrained by some decisions, Trinco, for example, rejecting leveraging, rejecting essentially essential facilities subject to Aspen, which played out in Qualcomm, as we know. Um, are these just areas, and, and by the way, obviously in, in Facebook, you have this issue of, you know, the right to refusal to refuse to deal, the old Colgate kind of doctrine raising its head when they say, well, no, if you're going to come and use my API to develop something, I want you to develop something I already have. You know, maybe there's free riding issues in terms of access to the network of users and all this kind of stuff. And so I guess one question I have looking in the future of antitrust, are we just gonna live in a world of divergence when it comes to use of leveraging, uh, which is standard, I think, in, in the EU in terms of distorting related markets? Essential facilities, call it something else in the EU, and it's rarely used, but it was used in the old Microsoft case. And uh, Elevia, let me start with you and just say, do you see that this is just an area where you're going to continue, you know, to look for essentially distortions of markets through leveraging or or refusals to deal where it's where it meets your criteria, and uh, you know, when you're quite flexible uh, in, in terms of looking where the, fa where the facts take you under those theories. Yeah, uh, first, I, I have to apologize because I'll have to leave you in 10 minutes. Uh, okay, if, if, if well, we're all, we're, you, and we're gonna <laughs> wrap up soon after that. I mean, we, we, were, all, we were somewhat hijacked by the, interestingly, you know, by the uh, Facebook. And so it's yeah. already been a fascinating discussion. Well, I, I need to meet Mrs. Vestager in, in 10 minutes. Yeah, um, that's, that's the, a good reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. The best. Um, no. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you're right. I mean, uh, uh, leveraging is, is pretty well accepted. And, um, and uh, well, it's basically what are we talking about? We're talking about, uh, again, I mean, multi-sided markets with... Uh, usually huge, uh, huge network effects. And uh, what, what these companies do is they use the network effects through several means uh, to monopolize another market, adjacent, close, potential competitor, what have you, uh, one way or the other, uh, what, or, or acquisition, as the, case, as the case may be. So, uh, and... Uh, and the issue we 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 have, uh, and also probably it's it's more of a of a pressing issue in the EU because we do not have this monopolization. So we, we cannot have a second bite of the cherry. We cannot review a second time, eight years after the transaction. Uh, uh, so for, for for that reason, um, we we need to find a way to be a lot more efficient the, the first time. So in mergers, but also in antitrust. 
and uh, and this is this is a bit the background behind our, our DMA story, which is that I mean, if I take um, Bill just referred to it, I mean, if I take the, the first uh, uh, Microsoft case, so Netscape, ninety percent of the world market or something like this, all of a sudden uh, Explorer is included into uh, the basic Windows offer, and in six months the market share drops to twenty percent. And one year after, they do not exist meaningfully uh, anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and what that gives is, a, is, is an idea for how quick these markets are tipping. They never tip back for a very long in time. And, uh, and the network effects are very, very powerful. And on the other side, you have the antitrust enforcement that is basically subject, at least in the EU, to a very high standard for interim measures. Very, very high. Uh, and um, and uh, basically, you can say three, four, five years later, this was bad, but you're three, four, five years later. Um, so that's, that, that's the point. And that's, that's probably why, faced with this very same issue and different legal system constraints or systemic constraints from the legal system, we, 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 we target different solutions, right. uh, I, I would say. Um, plus the natural appetite of European for ex ante regulation and, uh, and the natural disgust of American for the same ex ante regulation. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, uh, so Barry, do you see that this is, again, an area of, of divergence that will remain? Or uh, do you see, in a sense, whether it's coming from the US or rest of world, essentially doing things that were discussed in our opening remarks uh, that um, this take everything in a, in a different direction. I guess it wouldn't necessarily, again, I think as Bill said, the US would seem to be an outlier on those things absent um, regulation. Uh, what do you think, Barry? I think my guess is th that the US will, will be less of an outlier on section two law, join the rest of the world. Uh, and again, a guess uh, will be that 10 years from now, Leveraging will be clearly accepted under Section 2 again, and we'll be having a conference about the over-application of Section 2 uh, uh, for its chilling effects because of leveraging. So yes, I think, I think leveraging, as an example, will be accepted, if I have to guess, right? Uh, again, I'm putting a lot on the trial, strat trial strategy, the strategy of the FTC in that case, and, and Google the case too as well, right, of persuading the courts to stop, you know, to get over, to allay the court's concerns so they can start accepting like courts around the world accept leveraging what happened. That's my, but I, I think they will. I think courts will respond. Uh, it's my guess that courts will, US courts will respond and things like the dreaded things like leveraging uh, will be back. Well, let, let, me ask, let me ask Eleanor, yes. and, uh, Eleanor and Bill, given Trinco, which really I think killed it, and given, uh, and then given American Express, which if you really look at just a few of the passages there, and you keep in mind that American Express was dealing with a competitive process that was, appeared to be foreclosed. Um, but the court said, well, we're gonna look at a two-sided market and we're gonna look at metrics, I would say in almost a traditional Chicago school approach of price, output, this market seems to be doing well, even if rivals are harmed in this in, in this process. What do you think, uh, Eleanor and Bill, that the impact of Trinco and American Express sitting out there with a conservative court, even if some of these lower courts, like in Qualcomm, get enthusiastic about you know applying Section Two, uh, Section One, even Section Seven. Uh, in a more creative way in the digital economy, are they going to run into you know, a fairly um, conservative court that may not be as flexible? Uh, check, please. <laughs> yeah, our Supreme Court just got more conservative, Barry. Do you really think that the change, US joins the world on leveraging, how can it happen unless there's legislation? And then legislation is not easy, either to get or to formulate. Uh, I'll get, I'll get I, 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 I agree. Shot, my one yeah. shot at it, and I'm not saying it's a 
proven winner, but here's how I try. Yeah. And, and then I would ask for the check. But uh, I would take the Federal Trade Commission, a government mm. agency with its own dedicated internal administrative process in which it's expert, not a private trouble damage suit like Trinco. Right. Not a case that's tied up with the imposition of an extrinsic norm imported from an FCC rule into the analysis of the conduct. A dedicated administrative trial, Federal Trade Commission. And if I get back to the Supreme Court, I look at Justice Breyer, who signed Trinco after all. The second half of Trinco is pandering to Justice Breyer. That's Scalia saying, I want your vote. I'd say, Justice Breyer, I can see what you're concerned with here and in Discon and in Twombly. It's the runaway treble damage train that you think is filled with explosives, exactly the ones that Barry mentioned. I'd say, that's not us. We're the Federal Trade Commission. We are the public interest right here using our own expert process, which you, Justice Breyer, specialist in administrative law that you are, understand has special qualities. And we've done our homework really well. And we've built a good case. And so, here it is. And so this is why you can trust us to build this jurisprudence in this context. Footnote, I think it's a damn shame that the Facebook case is in federal district court and not in the Federal Trade Commission. And when the day comes in the next year or so, when the question is posed, why do we have a Federal Trade Commission? And you had a chance in your most important case to use your own mechanism. You told us you don't trust us. I wouldn't right. want to give that kind of answer to that kind of kind of right. question. So, uh, but I'd, I'd try my best shot at that. And if the Supreme Court looks at me and says, nice try, kid, go home, yeah. then I've got to walk across the street. Eleanor, right. before so, before your comments, let's say goodbye to uh, Olivier. I know he has to leave. If you have any, any, any uh, parting thoughts other than uh, thank you very much for your very insightful uh, comments. And we really look forward to uh, what DG Comp is uh, going to be doing in the coming months uh, and years? No, no, nothing specific except it's good to be back in uh, Fordham. Was uh, uh, good to see uh, you guys again after ten years uh, outside of home. Good to be back home. Oh, good. We'll look to see. You, uh, we will look for you uh, uh, in in September or October live. Some year. Hope so. Bye. So. Thanks, bye, Olivia. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, Eleanor. Bye, okay, Thanks. so I wanted to say bravo, Bill. Um, absolutely right. It won't happen, um, I think I'm adding, unless the FTC starts using Section 5 powers without saying this must violate the Sherman Act too, and the FTC starts combining the words unfair methods of competition with anti-competitive and uh, then that would be all good, except that what will cause the companies to stay in line anyway because of the weakness of the FTC's powers to punish them if they decide to keep doing what they're doing. But you can get structural relief in theory. And I know I'm, I'm stacking up assumptions and possibilities, but uh, I would like to see the effort made. I'd like to see the full try of what's there, what was intended to be there. And, and I accept the possibility. And James, I think, I think you're, you're, you're setting it out there. I mean, your question posed it very directly and appropriately. The possibility that the Supreme Court says, one, we don't like this elastic power you have. Two, we don't like you. That is, we think Humphrey's executor was a horrible mistake. Uh, and, and if we ever get a case that confronts it directly, we'll fix that too. Uh, but that three, um, you can't use section five to circumvent our very clear decision about what we think about leveraging, about essential facilities and you lose. And if that happens again, uh, as Justice Kagan pointed once, she said, we've always said you can go across the street to the big white dome building where the legislature sits. And maybe that's the point at which you say, I used every tool that you gave me and it's not working. And it says so right here. Well, let's leave it then at, uh, Barry, do you have any, uh, I'll give a, let's, let's leave it at, um, 
If they win, they win, and it'll be very interesting working its way up through the courts. If they lose and lose big, uh, it may uh, uh, bring some more vigor, uh, depending on what happens in Georgia and what happens with uh, you know, cloture and uh, filibusters uh, in terms of potential legislation, but certainly may incentivize that. Um, and Barry, our, uh, Eleanor, our, our, our Bill, I thank you all very much. If you have any parting words, uh, uh, do it now, um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Well, let me, let, let me just say, I, I, history supports Bill's strategy here, right? I mean, the FTC has history on its side, and if there's any historians among the conservatives on the Supreme Court, uh, they just, you just, the FTC could have reminded them that. The FTC Act was passed in 1914 because Congress did not like the Standard Oil's decision, adoption of the rule of reason. So they were, they, they, they expressed, they, they adopted, the, they, they set up the whole Federal Trade Commission. So you had an FTC section to avoid or supplement, however you want to put it, section two. I mean, it's, it's not complicated. I mean, that's the history. That's, that's what happened. Well, when you pass when you pass sixty, the neo Randaisian uh, feelings start to to arise. Uh, no, in, no, I am not. A lot of not. I am not a neo Brandeisian. <laughs> Brandeis, I find it hilarious that the the liberal progressives have adopted Brandeis as their hero. I mean, he was totally anti consumer, totally elitist. I mean, he'd never won an election in the United States. But that's another issue. That's another issue, I, and, and none of us in our, in our silence will necessarily agree with your observations. Um, and again, I, uh, I thank you all very much uh, for a very, very interesting panel, um, very timely, of course. And David, thank you to Juris uh, for putting this together. And uh, of course, thank you, uh, Fordham, and all of you have been uh, helping out with the Fordham Conference uh, over the many years and decades. Um, so thank you very much, David. I don't know if you have any Thing to say. I understand that this is being recorded. We've had some inquiries about that. And so I'm sure Juris will make it uh, available in some fashion. Um, and so anything from you, David, or? Well, just thank you to everyone again. It's been a great panel. And, and James, thank you again for being our moderator. I think you did an excellent job. And yes, uh, to anyone um, still on, um, we uh, it is being recorded and you will be sent um, an email with information on how to view that online. And if anyone has any questions um, about the, uh, the program today, you can reach us at marketing at juristpub.com. And again, as Barry said, does have that new book out published by Juris that is available on juristpub.com. It is available on Amazon as well. So thank you, everyone. Appreciate all of your time. Great program. And uh, we'll see you all again in the future. Please stay safe. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, James, Barry, Eleanor. Thank you.